Republican candidates getting ready to take the stage, but I got to talk to you about what happened at 3 o'clock this morning. I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning, had my cold shower, did my coconut oil pull, and then, you know, I started engaging in the spiritual, religious, psychological, physical, anthropological, and literary exercises that uh, I like to do to get my day going. And I'm watching the cricket, of course. Australia, just what a magnificent thrashing of, of India today so we've got the world series of cricket starting up next week i'd be i'm sure just on the edge of your your seat and uh, we're keeping our eyes on cb valley california so if anything goes on in the second republican debate we will bring that to you live but i just started listening to alan berger right I, i'm sure everyone here is uh, checking out this uh, terrific channel not the one on conspirituality but uh Optimal Recovery and Emotional Sobriety Institute. I mean, this is where it's at. So much great material. And I was just nailed, mesmerized, inspired, driven by this waking up from our sleepwalking part six conversation here on the Optimal Recovery and Emotional Sobriety Institute. This is Dr. Alan Berger, a psychologist, and he's talking about the work of the late psychologist, Dr. Karen Horney on resolving our internal conflicts and basic anxiety, right? It's a foundational aspect of why and how we go to sleep, right? You got to listen to this. And those concerns generate this anxiety. Now, I know if you're a human being, you've experienced anxiety in your life. Every one of us have or has. Um, sometimes it's so severe that we have a panic attack. Other times it's not as severe. It's a low-grade anxiety. Sometimes it's higher than that. But the one thing that I think we all know is that it's a terrible feeling. You know, I'd much rather be depressed than anxious. There's no question in my mind about it. I don't like anxiety. And so when we feel anxious, we are so motivated. To is that true? Would you rather feel depressed than anxious? I think I might, yeah. I don't, do not like feeling anxious, so... I might, I might tip my yarmulke to Alan Berger here. I think he's onto something. To try to find some way to resolve that anxiety, to find peace of mind, to find some equanimity, some quietness of mind, calmness of heart. That's what we all want. And so at a very, very early age, we come up with a plan. <laughs> and this idea is, I, I called it in the book, a blueprint. You know, it's a blueprint that we start laying down about who we have to become to ensure that we're going to be loved, that we're going to be accepted, and we're going to belong. Wow. Who we have to become in order to ensure that we're going to be you know, loved, to ensure that we're going to be loved. I don't know about you. That speaks to me. One of my favorite titles for a book is by the late Christian psychologist, psychiatrist Paul Tonier, A Place for You. Right? This is a place for you. Just... just I don't know, this yearning that I have for, for a place for me, you know, a place where I can, you know, feel whole, where I can feel, you know, at ease, where I can love and be loved. Now, her, Dr. Karen Horne is a prolific writer, or she was a prolific writer. She's left us a lot of great books. Um, the last work she did was called uh, um, Neurosis and Human Growth. And it's very technical book. It's really written for a professional level, not for the lay public, but you could pick it up and try to read it. You might find it accessible. Um, it takes me many, many reads to get through it in terms of even a chapter and so because it's so but, dense. But you could pick it up. She's so brilliant. You, but what she said is that typically we take three different paths. And early on in her career, she described them as what we move towards, what we move against, and what we move away from. Later on, she described these as the appeal of love, which is moving towards, the appeal of mastery, which is moving against, and the appeal of freedom, which is moving away from. She described them differently in her last book. Instead of moving towards, she called that um, the self-effacing solution because the appeal of love means I have to deny... I like that. So to reduce our anxiety, we all have three basic modes of going through life. In a chapter and so, because it's so dense and she's so brilliant. But what she said is that typically we take three different paths. And early on in her career... Okay, so think about all those people doing that, those smash and grabs, 
right, in, in Philadelphia, I think, and San Francisco and Los Angeles, right? So they're trying to master life, right? They're, they're trying to, you know, go at life. That's, that's one strategy. She described them as what we move towards, what we move against, and what we move away from. Later on, she described these as the appeal of love, which is moving towards, the appeal of mastery, which is moving against. Okay, so the appeal of love is moving towards. Okay, so that is one common response to anxiety. And there's nothing wrong with this response. There's anything or thing wrong with it when it just becomes a default, when we just kind of sleepwalk into a response. So becoming aware of our habitual responses to life, right? Do we try to navigate our anxiety? Do we try to navigate life by you know, moving towards people to try to show them love and try to get them to, you know, manipulate them into, into showing us love, right? Is, is that, you know, always a viable strategy? Obviously not, you know, frequently that's a lousy strategy. And the appeal of freedom, which is moving away from. Hmm. So the appeal of freedom. So this is the avoidant, right? Tends to be dominated by this moving away from connection. So this is the the resignation approach. This is the approach that says, I don't care about politics anymore. You know, politics is just so corrupt. You know, I just, I just don't care about politics anymore. I'm, I'm going to devote my other self to other things. All right. It's uh, just moving away. How often do I feel anxious? Well, my own response is not trustworthy. So I suspect that I feel a great deal more anxiety than I'm even conscious of. So how often do I feel like I have a problem with anxiety? I don't know, maybe 1%, 2% of the time. But it's probably there, right? If you got something going on in your life, you know, just in one area of your life, in all likelihood, it's all through your life. It's like cancer, right? It's like uh, bone cancer, right? you know, it manifests with a broken spine, but then it's probably all through your life. So if I'm conscious of anxiety in you know, on an occasional part of my life, it's probably there all throughout my life. I'm just not conscious of it. She described them differently in her last book. Instead of moving towards, she called that um, the self-effacing solution. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a perfectly good solution. You know, resignation at times, saying, hey, you know, I'm not a big deal. I'm, I'm just a secretary. I'm just doing my job. I'm just following orders. Oh, let me connect you to someone who's smart. All right, let me you know, turn this over to someone who really knows what's going on. All right, uh, I'm not a big deal. I, I'm nobody. All right, that's an effective coping mechanism at times, but sometimes it's maladaptive. Sometimes we should take charge. Sometimes we should lead. Sometimes we should be proactive. So there have been many times at work when I've tried to you know, create love out of nothing at all, and it hasn't gone so well. Instead, I should be focusing on, you know, mastery instead of trying to create love from nothing at all. Because the appeal of love means I have to deny myself and make myself an empty vessel so I can meet all your needs. So I remember the intoxicating effect of, of first love, you know, 16. It was the, gosh, the summer of 1982. First love, all right, this woman who was a year below me in school when I was going to Pacific Union College Elementary School. And we were both working at Pacific Union College in the summer of 1982. It was first love. And it was just so intoxicating. And people around me noticed that, uh, hey, I'm just, you know, in love with love. But, uh, you know, she really took over my heart and my, my life. And uh, I was, you know, I was absolutely humbled. I was, I was absolutely smitten, but didn't necessarily bring out the, you know, the best in me. It made me highly insecure. And so when I moved away from PUC at the end of the summer, I went back to life in Auburn, California, which was two and a half dri dri hours drive away from Pacific Union College. So when I launched into my, my junior year of high school, I would try to get back to Pacific Union College as often as I could. But I would write to her, we'd write to each other, and I just missed her so much. And, and going back home to my home, you know, in Auburn just felt so cold and so devoid of love compared to what I was creating with this girl at uh, Pacific Union College. 
But then when I come back to PC, I remember one time she talked about how she'd been going to rock concerts with this college guy. She'd gone to see Journey with this college guy. And I got so jealous that I just cut her off. Right? I, I didn't write to her anymore. And there was like a three-month gap where, where she never heard from me. And she you know, finally broke down and sent me a letter saying how hurt she was. Right? So I guess I was deliberately inflicting pain on her because I'd felt so much pain thinking that, you know, my, my girlfriend was, you know, going out with this college guy to rock concerts and I couldn't provide her with rock concerts. I didn't even have my driver's license yet. I, I hadn't even been to a, a rock concert yet. Wouldn't go to my first rock concert till the summer of uh, 1986. So I was, I was hurt and I was intimidated. And so I deliberately hurt her by just, you know, cutting off all, all communication with her. When I went back to Pacific Union College, summer of 1983, then uh, we fell into step again, and I was walking with her, walking through the woods at Pacific Union College, and after we crossed this, this little stream, I, I leaned over, and for the first time, I kissed her, because I'd learned to kiss over the previous few months. And I kissed her on the lips, and then I started nibbling on her lips, and then our tongue started exploring and dancing together. And when we finally paused to take breath, she said, we could have been doing this last summer, but I didn't know how last summer. I was, I was too intimidated. But now I was still carrying a bit of a burn that she'd been going to rock concerts with this college guy. And so when she wouldn't let me go further than kissing, she told me, oh, I'm not that kind of girl. Well, when she wouldn't let me go further, then I just dropped her and I started, you know, focusing my attention on this, you know, college woman and, you know, going to movies with her. Ah, oh, so yeah, excessively moving towards love, you know, excessively i was excessively focused on her because being in love with her made all you know my pain and anxiety go away but you know i lost touch with myself what i needed i was so vulnerable and hurt when she was you know going to rock concerts with some college guy and you know i was excessively oriented towards her instead of appropriately looking after myself and developing my own mastery of life such as getting a driver's license and the ability to take a, a girl to a rock concert I think this is what we classically have called codependency. The moving against, she called the, the movement towards mastery or the expansive solution. Yeah, so wherever you're at in life. So I heard a great analogy from Dr. Stephen Marmer, a frequent guest on Dennis Prager's radio show, that no matter where you're at in life, you're always winding between one of four states. One is mastery. And wherever you're at in life, you can always work on gaining more mastery. Another state is feeling small in a big world, right? We never completely graduate from that. We will always return to feeling small in a big world at times. Uh, another state is helpless, right? Uh, our back will go out, you know, we'll lose our health, uh, you know, computer will break down, we'll face some, you know, obstacle that we can't overcome through our own abilities and powers, right? There'll always be times of helplessness in our life and there'll always be times of grandiosity, when we just feel like, you know, we're mastering life and, you know, we're just so awesome. And then we will, you know, spiral from there into helplessness or feeling small in a big world or developing a real keen sense, accurate sense of mastery. So that's moving against the world and carry Horn, Karen Horne's formulation. And uh, this is an excellent way of dealing with anxiety. If you can genuinely develop mastery over live streaming, over how your car works, how your computer works, over your job, over your education, over your career, over your friendships, over your place in the community, over your volunteer positions, over your hobbies, over your, your body, your spirit, your soul. Anytime you develop mastery, that significantly, I find, reduces anxiety, becoming more competent at life, getting more money in the bank, you know, becoming more adept at more and more parts of life, becoming smoother in your interactions with other people and with yourself, learning to meditate, learning to work out appropriately, learning to, you know, be able to soothe and calm yourself during times of stress and anxiety, right? We can always develop mastery. So that's moving against the world. So moving towards someone, that's the path of love. And then resignation, moving away from, that is kind of the, the avoidant, solution. And sometimes it's a good one, right? All of these responses have their place. It's just that we don't want to sleepwalk into these habitual responses to anxiety. We want to choose them appropriately in an adaptive and beneficial fashion. And that is, is because we think if we're the best, if we're right all the time, if we're number one, then we're going to be. 
I still love Journey. I've got about five of their, you know, uh, top hits on, on my iPhone. Uh, remain a, a big fan of Journey to this day. But uh, I, I reconnected with that woman. She she hit me up, and she said, you know, hey, Luke, remember me? We we used to write letters to each other, and uh, yeah, we we just uh, reconnected in in the last eighteen months. Loved and accepted. And the last one, appeal of freedom, is the moving away from, and she called that the solution of resignation that we just. So that was my father's solution in, in many ways, all right? He would often echo Jean-Paul Sartre, hell as other people. And there's a time and a place to moving away, a time and a place for, for valuing freedom. But if it becomes a habitual response, it means you're in all likelihood avoidant, that you avoid normal human connection. And that usually is not a formula for a winning life. But there is certainly time and a place for resignation, for moving away, you know, moving away from danger moving away from something that's dangerous for you because you may have various addictions, you know, moving away from people and situations who are bad for you. Just give up. So I want to talk about all three of these. So I was up at 3 a.m., all right? And so I started moving into mastery, all right? Uh, spiritual practices, my, you know, religious practices, my, my physical practices, my strain, counter-strain physical therapy. I was doing some planks, some exercises, some, you know, strength exercises. I've, you know, largely gotten rid of my golfer's elbow. Uh, I was, you know, watching uh, Australia, so that was just, you know, a bit of fun. I, I was, you know, learning things that I want to write about, that I want to talk about on these live streams. So developing mastery in the first few hours of my day before I start having to earn a living. These things, and I'll talk about how they resolve this anxiety and how taking one of those. And the chat says, I'd like to hear you read some of those old love letters. Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, I did not. Did not keep them, but uh, you can you can get a sense of my inner life looking at my my fiction. Have you guys have you guys read my my poetry? Have you read my have you read my fiction? So my fiction came from a real place. So here I'll throw throw a link. So this is this is kind of what's going on. My my favorite group is Air Supply. So you know that that tells you the Australian group. Uh, pop group that had so many, you know, hits in the early 1980s. That's been my favorite group, you know, throughout my life. So that tells you about my tendencies towards love addiction. So I, I met this girl, Rachel, in 1984 when I moved to Gladstone, Australia. And uh, four years later, fall of 1988, I was just beginning UCLA. I had a head full of calculus and I paused to reminisce this brunette I met in Gladstone, Australia in the last few months of 1984. And I begin with a few lyrics from the song by the cars, Drive. Who's going to pay attention to your dreams? Who's going to plug their ears when you scream? Who's going to drive you home tonight? Four years later, it still hits me hard, piercing my skin and clawing at my heart. The effect is always the same, whether I'm flying 800 miles per hour over the Pacific Ocean, hurtling my Volkswagen bug along the snowy Interstate 80 across the Sierra Nevada mountain range, covering the San Francisco 49ers versus the Dallas Cowboys at Candlestick Park, or dancing my mind to sleep on the crowded floor of a Californian nightclub. Drive by the cars is about the only thing that knocks me off schedule these days, jarring econometric formula out of my mind. For three minutes and 50 seconds, life no longer reduces to differential calculus. For three minutes and 50 seconds, I question and doubt, is there more to life than sex and success? For more than three minutes and 50 seconds, my mind washes with memories of walking along the Gladstone Wharf in small town, tropical Australia, 1984, with her, Rachel, a phantom of delight, sweet 16 and shy. She had black shoulder-length hair, short on the sides and on top, a la the movie Flashdance. I walk past her every day at 5.18 p.m. closing time. So I've just finished my shift at uh, GJ Coles, which was a subset of uh, Kmart in Australia. I'd smile and joke with her. She'd look up at me. She'd giggle that her mother would come by and she'd pick up Rachel and her twin sister, Leanne, and take them home. So I'd spend my days composing witty sayings to lay upon Rachel. Sometimes they jumbled, but Rachel pretended not to notice. It took me several weeks to work up the courage to ask her out. One Friday, knowing that my brother Paul would be away all weekend and that I'd have the car resolved to invite Russia, Rachel to dinner and dancing that evening. So shoot out of work at 5.15 p.m., rush up the street to talk to her at half a block away. However, I see that her mother was there early 
can only wave as Rachel rode away. So once home, I stormed through the phone book and found four families with Rachel's last name. I caught each in vain. My house was empty. This was one evening I would not be alone. I showered, I dressed, I drove back to Gladstone. I resolved to lose my troubles in the smoke and noise of the Shanghai disco. As I drove, the radio played my song, drenching me in questions. Rachel, Rachel, who's going to drive you home tonight? I came into town with the irrational thought that I was going to see her tonight. The rational side of my brain said, no way. She was too young to get into the Shanghai disco. I knew nothing else in Gladstone that night that might attract her. The disco was packed. I disappeared easily into the mass of moving bodies, merging at last into a little corner overlooking the dance floor. I found a friend, Sue Scott, my brother's new girlfriend. He had left her behind on his weekend jaunt to the great Keppel Island Resort. It's just a special trip for the soccer team, Paul had told her. He told me that taking Sue to Great Capital Island would be like taking Cole to Gladson. Sue said she understood, but she didn't. We found a table. We sat talking. She was drinking heavily. She needed a little stimulus to spill her pain. I sit there hour after hour listening to her problems, watching her face fade in and out of the smoke and the flashing lights. By 11 p.m., we were both feeling miserable, needing a break from the noise and the garish atmosphere. I walk out of the disco into the calm spring night. I walk alone. Familiar feeling to me to this day. Past my brother's real estate office, past Rachel's law office, all the way down Gundoon Street until businesses turned into homes. I circled back, walking quickly to try to get Rachel off my mind. Then out of a coffee shop, she came. She walked 50 yards in front of me with a female friend. Rachel could not see me in the darkness, but I could see her silhouetted against street lights. Oh, what was it you said, Mr. Wordsworth? A dancing shape, an image gay to haunt, to startle, and waylay. With the phantom of delight just ahead of me, I could hardly breathe. I listened to her laugh with a friend. I could smell her perfume. She was so sweet, so innocent, so right there. It's too much. I fled across the street and tried to walk away from her. Oh, Luke. I heard her cry my name. She smiled at me. She beckoned across the street. Back to her. I walked to her, unable to breathe, unable to speak. She introduced her friend, but I could only nod. I fell in with them. We walked down the street, past the Shanghai disco, and onto the Gladstone Harbor. She'd seen a play in town. Afterwards, they had paused for a chocolate milkshake at the coffee shop. Our conversation came easily. Another one of Rachel's friends joined us, and then we paired off. I walked alone with Rachel on the wharf. Would have been glad to talk to her until morning. She needed to get home. Who's going to drive you home tonight, I asked. She laughed. She loved that song by the cars, too. Rachel didn't need to call her parents, who were taxi cab drivers, for I was going to drive her home tonight. I made my way uncertainly along darkened streets and used to driving on the left side of the road. The radio played drive. I felt fortune smiling on me. Rachel's white teeth flashed smiles at me in the flickering light. We stopped outside her home. I turned to her and said, hey, would you like to come to me with a party hosted by Sue Scott tomorrow night? She said she would. Before she left, she wrote a phone number on the only piece of paper I had, a spearmint gun wrapper, which I still cherish. Well, I did in 1988. Did not cuss, kiss or even hug her goodnight. I felt no need. The promise, future promise, complete satisfaction. Well, that promise quickly shattered. Her parents forced her to cancel a date because they had confused the name of the host of this party with another woman in town who had a bad reputation. Next weekend, I call up Rachel. Can't reach her, so I ended up asking out her twin sister, Lee Ann, a vivacious personality in her own night. So we spend an active evening, evening together, eating, drinking, swimming. Around 11 p.m., we walk beside the harbor where we meet Rachel and her date. We all laugh. Lee Ann and I move on. I take her to Tenham Sands Beach. We sit on the beach as the sun rises. I never got to go out with either of them again. They found other men. <laughs> okay. Back to the serious stuff. Three paths puts us to sleep. Because. Yeah, so we have all these habitual responses, all right? And any of these responses love, uh, seeking freedom, or seeking mastery, all great responses. But sometimes I pursue love when I should be pursuing mastery. And sometimes I pursue mastery when I should pursue freedom and resignation. And sometimes I pursue resignation when I should pursue love. So we want to be mindful about what our most habitual path is out of anxiety. Every path that we take puts us into a trance. And that's what Gurdjieff was so great at talking Right. So if we just act habitually, we, we go through life in, in a trance. And we want to wake up and be alive and become more aware of our choices and make sure that they are serving us. How is that working for you? It's a great Dr. Phil question, but it really is a good question talking about he says that that we have to all realize that we're all asleep dreaming that we're awake but we cannot wake up with this with the information that put us into the trance at first this is where we need new information and new experience to start waking up and sometimes that's really stimulated and evoked and provoked from pain we talk about in the big book is hitting bottom 
So I've been going through the archives of my blog. Got to find this post where my father says, you'll only learn through pain. I, he just saw my, my ineffective ways at reacting to life, responding to life, going about life ineffective ways that I talked to people and treated people and he's he tried to you know steer me straight kept saying you can't talk to girls the same way you talk to boys you, know, you have to be more careful about how you speak to people who have power over you or they will hurt you and uh, at a certain point he kind of didn't fully gave give up but he partly gave up and he just started relapsing into the refrain you'll only learn through pain you'll only learn through pain and dad gummit he was right I only learned through pain. Most people only enter 12 step or enter therapy when things seriously go wrong in their lives. They, you know, only learn through pain. Where's that blog post, man? So let's take the appeal of love first, right? What she called moving towards. Well, this person resolves that anxiety about being loved and accepted because they believe that if they can just find someone to love them and that they can love, that their life is going to be okay. For this person, love carries a very, very magical quality to it. If you're able to find that special one, and this person will have fantasies about that finding that you know soulmate, finding that one person that's going to understand you, that's going to be there for you, that you're going to be able to make happy. That's so intoxicating when you, when you get a taste of this. <laughs> I don't know about you. It just seemed to make all my anxiety go away, but of course that you know, fairly quickly fades uh, various women who were just incredibly loving and doting uh, within a few weeks or a few months. I, I, they, they were so low functioning, they started to feel like a millstone around my neck. Well, just I'm thinking of one in particular. And by making them happy and fulfilling all their needs that you're going to be complete. So the desire to please overrides everything else, which means that we have to get rid of our own needs because I can't be everything you need me to be if I have any needs myself. So remember last time I talked. Right. So if you become you know, too obsessed with loving people, you won't take adequate care of yourself. You won't meet your responsibilities and you won't devote enough attention to mastery, then, I, you know, I often get up 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Typically by 6 o'clock, you know, I am done. I am verklempt. I am, you know, tired. It's time to start moving into resignation. So when I finish this show, I need to work out. I need to do my pull-ups and my push-ups and my weights and my exercise bike. But then by about 8 p.m., right, definitely time for resignation and chill and just, you know, watch an episode or two of Cheers and uh, go off to sleep. So, Certainly the last hour or two of the day is the time for just resignation. Talked about the fragmentation of, of our personality. Well, in this case, I have to deny my needs so that I can be available for yours. And there's certainly a time and a place to ignore your own needs, to take care of other people. All right, I, I volunteer several hours a week, between 5 to 15 hours a week. You know, I put other people's needs ahead of mine. But uh, you can, you know, go way too far with that as well. So, for example, in Under Owners Anonymous, they're quite skeptical about volunteering. Dead is Anonymous strongly encourages volunteering because it often leads to making connections and uh, getting work and, you know, finding new paths to prosperity. But uh, Under Owners Anonymous is quite skeptical of volunteering because a lot of under owners habitually you know over volunteer rather than developing mastery and taking good care of themselves so the typical person i read in a paper by one economist is 95 percent selfish so i kind of aim for about 90 percent selfish life so i think if you can get a life that's 90 to 95 percent selfish then you're ahead of the game you're less selfish than the average person so I will become desensitized to my wants and I will become hyper vigilant of what you want. I will know what you want before you even know it. Right. So often women are like this and then they get often get mad at men. You know, why, why aren't you as aware of what I want as, you know, I am of what you want? And a great male answer is if I was as aware of these things as you are, you know, I would be after to hold down a job and earn the money to bring home the bacon and, and pay the bills, right? There's only so much processing power, 
superpower that you know we have in our brains. My father would often forget my name. He'd often forget the names of all of his kids because he was so devoted to his career, to his cause, to you know, saving the world for, for Jesus Christ. And that comes at a price, right? You know, my, my father was very dedicated to his career, to his preaching and teaching, his writing, his scholarship, his uh, Good News Unlimited Foundation. But that, you know, by putting that first, right, that came, that came at the price of his family. Like, you know, a lot of people put, put their family first, but then that will come at, at a price of, uh, uh, of your career, right? You can't, can't put everything first, right? We have to make, uh, make some decisions here. So keeping an eye on the Republican debate, if anything happens, we'll, we'll cut to it. I think it's the kind of thing that happens with this. I will anticipate everything. And if I fail you, I am going to feel a great deal of shame. And uh, chat says, I'm amazed how little sleep you can get away with. Well, I'm typically in bed by about 9 p.m., typically up about 3 a.m., so I'd say I get uh, probably five hours of sleep. I do not set my alarm at 3 a.m. I do not intend to get up at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 1.30 a.m. It just happens that way because there are you know, various projects that I'm working on. I want to pull together my rules for life, my principles for decoding reality, my best blog posts, perhaps turn them into a book, but develop them, hone them, uh, hire a, an editor to make them better, combine them, you know, move them together, rearrange them. I heard my arguments, you know, correct mistakes, factual, logical, philosophical, uh, moral. I, I just want to, you know, get down how I see the world and make it as sharp and clear and as effective as possible. So that inspires me. So I can't wait to get up at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Like I am jonesing to get up and to get to work. And if I could sleep, occasionally I get to sleep till 5 a.m. and I'm thrilled, right? I'd be thrilled to sleep till 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. It just never happens because I'm just so excited going through life. Now, I couldn't do this if I wasn't enjoying my life, right? I spend a lot of time around people I love and people who love me. And then when I'm not around them, I've got projects that I love. I love what I'm doing right now. I love, you know, working on my best blog posts, you know, I love developing my ideas about how I understand the world, my my rules for life. You know, what what are the most important ideas? Maybe develop a list of my top ten blog posts. Right, that that excites me. So if I wasn't doing things that excite me, and if I wasn't around people who excite me, and if I didn't have a life that excited me, then I would definitely need more sleep. I am not deliberately starving myself of sleep. Right, I I would sleep longer if if I could. It's just that I love going. You know, going through my life right now and just what is you know jam as much of it as possible it's, it's very rare that i yawn during the day so no more than once a week perhaps once every two weeks i uh, went four days without coffee then i had two cups of coffee today so that's probably why i've got you know a little extra energy uh, if i can sleep in till close to 4 a.m then you know definitely don't need any coffee so i try to go several days without coffee and then have, have a day or two where i indulge anxiety because if you don't love me, there's going to be serious trouble in my life. It's going to... Pro okay, Elliot Blatt says, all of my anxiety revolves around money, but that's just the symptom, right? What's underneath that, right? What's underneath that is a lack of sense, perhaps, of being able to master life, a lack of sense of being able to live up to adult responsibilities and to thrive, a lack of a sense that you, know, you are adaptively expertly, efficiently, effectively, and gracefully, you know, moving through life and living up to your abilities. And so this is just the symptom, the, the fear of money, right? It, it, it's just the thing that distracts you from the real problem. You are so smart, Elliot Blatt, that if lack of money was the problem, then you would fix it. But lack of money is just the thing that stands out for you and distracts you from the much deeper problems of Perhaps anxiety, depression, uh, lack of connection, uh, lack of feeling like you're, you know, living life to the full, a, a deep gnawing sense that life is, is passing you by, that chances for normal human wholeness and connection are, you know, just missing you. And, and this haunting fear is probably what's underneath the, 
the open, explicit anxiety about money. Provoke and, and reconnect me with all of that anxiety that happened originally that sent me off in this direction. So every relationship that we have, especially those that... Lack of money leads to homelessness. Now, lack of an eff life that works leads to a lack of money. Right? If you love other people, right, you cannot help but be prosperous. Right? You love other people, seek to serve other people. Right? You cannot help but be prosperous. A lack of money is a symptom of an unwillingness, an inability, inability an awkwardness with being of service to other people. Once your mind and your heart and your physiology and your soul and your spirit have rearranged so that you look forward to serving other people, prosperity flows from that. Homelessness, poverty, debt, under-earning, these are all symptoms of a disconnected life, a fundamental selfishness, a, a gaping psychic wound that is getting in the way of normal human functioning. A normal person looks forward to being helpful to other people. But if your psychic wounds, your spiritual, psychological childhood wounds are so enormous that you're just walking around wounded, all right, you've got some you know, giant wound in you and the, the psychological blood is gushing out, all you can do is be obsessed with that wound. Just like if you had a literal wound in you, all you could do is be obsessed with that wound. So if you are wounded, you're going to be obsessed with that wound. And until you find a way to staunch the psychic bleeding, right? Until you fill that hole in your soul, you cannot help but be obsessed with your wounds, which prevents you from joyfully, happily, normally, naturally seeking to be of service for, to others. And when you normally, naturally, healthfully, and happily seek to be of service for others, prosperity flows from that and a considerable reduction in anxiety as you learn to form normal human connections. And when you have a problem, you can turn to your normal human connections and get advice and guidance and overcome things that you couldn't overcome on your own because a group strategy almost always outcompetes an individualist strategy. But instead, if you've got this gaping psychic wound and you suffer a bump in the road, all right, you're very likely to retreat into the cave and then various normal you know, adult obligations you have, you may just blow them off. You may not even send a text saying, hey, I'm sick. I can't make it. You just blow off normal human relationships, normal adult obligations, which makes you even more desperate, more alone, more wounded, more screwed up, more dysfunctional, more in debt, more under earning. And these things just spiral on top of each other. That are significant, important to us, have so much. We have. When I serve others, they take advantage of me. No. When you seek to staunch your psychic wounds by inordinately pursuing you know, service of others, going after others, loving others in the hope that they will then take care of you, you're trying to take emotional hostages, right? You're going about it in a, in a very unhealthy way, but you're justifying it yourself. I'm just trying to serve others. I'm just trying to love other people. I'm just trying to be helpful. I'm just trying to be the good guy here. But what's really going on is you're trying to take emotional hostages and and manipulate people so that they will then take care of you. And if I just do this for this person, if I just do this for this person, if I just do this for this person, then they will meet my needs. And finally, I'll start getting my needs taken care of. If I just take this person emotionally as an emotional hostage, well, it doesn't work out that way, right? Sometimes you know, pursuing love of other people is a maladaptive response. You should instead be pursuing mastery of yourself, of life, of your skills, or even uh, freedom and resignation. So much investment in them, and there's so much at risk. So it creates a tremendous amount of tension, especially if... If only Elliot could make a connection with the person at Whole Foods making his sandwiches. <laughs> the Mighty Puck says, my money concerns are definitely related to not having useful skills. I have a good job, but I'm a middle manager. I envy my friends who are software developers. Ah, the greatest skill you can have is normal human connection. All right. If people enjoy you, if people love you, if people like you, if people want you around, the world will open up to you. And what determines your ability to develop human connections? If people feel good from interacting with you, right? a lot of people are awkward. When you interact with someone who's awkward, you will feel icky and you want to minimize your interactions with that person. 
if you interact with people who are off key, who are needlessly inappropriate, uh, cruel, socially maladjusted.